joined now by a man, if you're around SEC football, if you're around the great state of Tennessee, man that almost needs no introduction himself, Bob Kessling, the voice of the Volunteers. Bob, welcome to the Mitch Davis Show. How are you doing today? Mitch, I'm great. Uh, going through a really spectacular football season and kind of an unexpected football season, but it's had a lot of great moments already. And uh, hopefully there are a lot more to come before they get wound up. Bob, uh, there's a big old game in Athens we're going to get to, but I want to start this thing off by asking you about the uh, win over Alabama first time in 15 years. What did that mean for this program, and what did that mean for you personally? Well, it was just such a series of frustrating losses. Uh, and, you know, the Tennessee-Alabama series especially, have been playing for over 100 years, and I think it means a lot to both programs. I, I think both schools – kind of respect each other in terms of their football tradition, their championships, their coaches, the players that have played in this. It's a clean rivalry. It's a hard fought rivalry. And, but the fact when you don't win for a long time, the kind of the rivalry loses some of its luster. And uh, so to, to get that setting, to get Alabama in here, to have this Tennessee team suddenly playing so well, uh, there was a confidence about the, the team. There was a confidence about the fan base and, uh, of course, there were some ups and downs in that game. And uh, so when finally Tennessee was able to get that field goal to go through, just like all of this weight had been lifted off everybody's shoulders and you just celebrated. And it was uh, it, it was really a special night. It was one of the greatest football games I've ever seen. And, and not from the fact that Tennessee won the game. It's from the fact that Hendon Hooker and Bryce Young just were tremendous. I mean, they they played lights out. Both quarterbacks played like Heisman Trophy winners. And uh, – so that's it's not like, you know, Alabama was bad that night. Tennessee was just better. And uh, that's what it made it even more satisfying. It was a close game, tight game, and, and Tennessee found a way to win, which is something, you know, Tennessee struggled with a little bit last year. Now they're learning how to win, and they're closing out games, and it's really exciting. Bob, I want to ask you about this team, and obviously big matchup with Georgia this weekend. Winner likely goes to Atlanta to represent the SEC East and the SEC Championship game. What have you seen out of this team? You know, obviously a great team, but not the most talented team, just the team that has gotten hot. What have you seen out of this team? What do you expect to see out of the matchup with Georgia on Saturday? Well, what I've seen from this team is that they've collectively and individually have gotten better each and every week. Uh, you know, for four straight weeks, Tennessee's had an SEC Offensive Lineman of the Week. I mean, that's, I don't know if that's ever happened in program history. And that just tells you how well the offensive line is playing. Uh, the defense, uh, the defensive line is playing with basically the same guys they had last year, except for Matthew Butler, who's now in the NFL. But all those guys have taken a step forward and are really playing at a high level. So uh, Jalen Hyatt is a guy that couldn't get off the field, on the field last year. Now he's got 14 touchdown catches, which is a new school record for a single season. Um, you can go down the list of guys that really weren't big contributors last year that have suddenly gotten better. And that's, you kind of tip your hat to the coaching staff because they they have done a great job with this crew. And there's a quiet confidence about this team. They, they're, no, they're not these ups and downs that sometimes teams have. You haven't seen one of those clunkers uh, that most teams have in a season. Every time Tennessee's taken the field under Josh Heupel, they've been prepared, they've been ready to play, and they've played really up to their ability, which is all you can ask uh, from a fan or also from a coaching staff. You know, Bob, there's been a lot of conversation. I wrote an article about this the other day, talking about 1998, the similarities. What similarities, what comparisons would you make to that 1998 team that won the national championship? Well, the 98 team got a lot of, you know, games, close games that kind of went their way. And um, it's, you know, you go back and look at the the Syracuse game and the Arkansas game and, 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 and the Florida game. All those games, it took one or two plays for – Tennessee to be able to pull that game out. I think overall the 98 team probably more talented and had, you know, better players overall, but I'm not sure they played any better as a team as this one's doing. So, uh, you know, each team is different. Uh, that was a special team that had great leadership with, with Al, Al Wilson and, uh, and all those guys. They had a lot of good players on that team. But uh, you know, this team has kind of come in unheralded. Uh, a lot of people were saying if they could win nine games, maybe it'd be a great season. I don't think anybody anticipated this team could be 8-0. And, and if you win Saturday, you've got the basically a clear path to the SEC championship game. So um, both of those, you know, the, the 98 team was supposed to be good. Uh, the 97 team was probably even better than the 98 team. 
But the 98 team played as a team and uh, and won the games that they really had to win. So I, I think there's similarities between every championship team. I think each one has their own special, unique qualities. But every one of the championship teams that you look at down through the years, they got that special it about them. You know, sometimes it's hard to find out what the it is, but they all have that it. And I think uh, – I, I think this team's got that it too. I think they just uh, have a lot of confidence in this help and, and that they think they're going to win every week. And so far they have. I think for a guy like you and I were talking about before, a guy like myself, I've looked up to you for a long time. A lot of people across the state have. I want to go down memory lane now with you for a little bit and talk with you about your career. Obviously you came to Tennessee, you know, way back in the day, you talked to coach battle. You're a walk on at Tennessee. Yeah. How did that conversation go? How did you get to Rocky top? It is an, it's an unbelievable story. I, I had a buddy in high school. We were good friends. His dad knew Ray Mears back when Ray Mears was the basketball coach at Wittenberg, which is in Springfield, right outside Dayton, where I grew up. And so uh, his dad was going to bring him down here to talk with Coach Mears about maybe, maybe being a manager on the basketball team or, or trying out for the freshman team. And as it turns out, he made the freshman team and then later became the manager during the Ernie and Bernie years. But uh, they invited me to come down with them. And I didn't, I didn't, I'd never been to Tennessee. Didn't know anything about it. I knew it was down I-75, but I didn't, I didn't know much about it. I was being recruited by a bunch of small schools in Ohio. And so I was thinking I would just, you know, wind up at a place like Wittenberg or Muskingum or University of Dayton or something like that. And, uh, but I rode down here with them and uh, I'd gotten some letters from some mid-American teams, but no offers and nothing special going on. So, but I knew I wanted to try and play college football somewhere. And uh, so I rode down with, uh, with my buddy and they went to the basketball office. I said, well, there's no reason for me to sit down there and listen to that because I don't have any interest in basketball. So I just wandered down to Bill Battle's office and just asked the secretary and I said, what does it take to walk on uh, the football team at Tennessee? She said, I don't really know. Would you like to talk to Coach Battle? I said, well, sure. I mean, within five minutes, I'm in Coach Battle's office. I, I don't have a roster or any film to even prove that I even played high school football. But they were recruiting, uh, actually recruiting a couple guys off our team that I didn't know at the time. And the, they were also recruiting a couple of players from Troy, which is in our league. And Coach Battle told me he knew my coach and all that kind of stuff. And next thing I knew, I'm down talking to uh, Kurt Watson and Don McClary, who were the freshman running back coaches. And they put some film on and showed me the Tennessee offense. And after about 10 minutes of that, they walked me back down to Coach Battle's office. He handed me a workout sheet and um, said, we'd love to have you on the team. And I said, holy smokes, I couldn't believe it. And uh, – so they said, if you can get in school, they probably didn't think I could get in school. So that was the hitch. But uh, anyway, so I called my dad and of course my dad was a big Ohio State guy. And uh, I said, well, dad, I think I'm going to go to Tennessee and walk on. He said, well, if you're going to walk on a big school, you need to go to Ohio State. I said, well, dad, it's cheaper for me to go to Tennessee out of state than it is Ohio State in state. And his response was go Vols. And so, and that's, that's how it happened. So I wound up here. I didn't know anybody on the team. I didn't know anybody in the state of Tennessee. I'd spent five minutes with Coach Battle and about 10 minutes with uh, Kurt Watson and Don McClary. Those are the only three guys I knew in the state of Tennessee. But uh, I walked on and we played and we had a freshman team. We played Notre Dame and Alabama and uh, Kentucky. And, and so I got to play quite a bit on the freshman team. And and uh, then, you know, then you got to make the decision. The life of a walk-on at an SEC school is really hard. And so I had to determine, they already told me I was going to register it the next year and then, you know, have to fight your way up. So I was looking at maybe two years or three years without even playing, just practicing. And I just kind of decided I needed to go on with my life and, and get on with it. But I, I enjoyed my time playing and still have some good buddies from, uh, from that freshman team we were on. Coach Fulmer was the graduate assistant and Tim Priest was a graduate assistant on that freshman team. So I've known those guys since 1972. So overall, it was a fabulous, fabulous experience for me and a great opportunity. And I cherish the, the fact I got to wear the orange shirt and play at Neyland Stadium and and uh, and do all those type of things. So, uh, but uh, I was not going to be a star in the SEC and I, I figured that out pretty quick. And so I needed to get on with my life. Coach Fulmer always told me you needed to broaden my horizons while I was playing which I finally figured out he was telling me I needed to do something other than play football at Tennessee. So, but it, it worked out great. I think that's an incredible story. I actually was listening to, I think a TV interview that you did a couple of months ago 
And uh, that's a really cool story mm-hmm. I have to ask you. So I want to ask you, how did you get into broadcasting? Obviously, you got to work under the legendary John Moore. That's going to be the follow-up question to that. But how, how did you get into broadcasting? Locked into it. I, had, I was uh, going to, uh, when I was in school, I was going to be a PR major. I knew I wanted to do something in sports. I don't know whether I wanted to coach or be a sports writer or what I wanted to do, but I really didn't think anything about broadcasting. And um, so, but I was going to be a PR major. And so uh, I talked my way into getting a job with the old Knoxville Sox baseball team, a double A team, which is now the Tennessee Smokies, but they played right downtown in Bill Meyer stadium. And uh, I got paid. It was a great summer job when I was at school. I got paid a hundred bucks a week and I got to put the flagpole uh, flag up and cook hot dogs and sell tickets and sell programs and all that kind of stuff. Take guys to the doctor and take the uniforms over to the laundry and all those types of things. And so when I graduated, um, I thought I was going to get a baseball job, but while one of the things I did while I was working for the baseball team, I wrote up little 30 second voicers after every game and I called them in to all the radio stations that would answer the phone. I didn't pay anything extra to do it. I just thought if we get more people at the games, maybe I'll get more than a hundred bucks a week working. And so uh, I uh, called these things in and uh, some of the radio stations in town ran them. And so out of the blue one day, WIVK called me and said, listen, we're, uh, we're looking for a part-time sportscaster. We run your reports on the baseball games and th- think you sound pretty good. So why don't you come over and, uh, you know, do part-time sports with us. I said, sure. So I was doing morning sports, going to school and working for the baseball team at night and just having a ball. And, but when I graduated, I thought, well, I'm going to go get a baseball job. You know, this is what I've trained to do. And uh, I knew something about working in a front office and what baseball life is like. And so I was getting ready to walk out the door to go to Nashville to the baseball meetings to get a job. And um, I just graduated. I was getting ready to get married. And uh, as I was walking out the door, Bobby Denton, who was a longtime PA announcer at Neyland Stadium, Bobby Denton was uh, standing on the porch. He was the afternoon disc jockey as well at WIBK. And he says, where are you going, hot shot? I said, well, I'm going to Nashville to get a baseball job. I got to, you know, I got to find a full-time job. He said, well, we've just bought a radio station in Nashville. And uh, Paul Lyle, who's our sports director here, is going to go over there and be the sports director. Why don't you stay here and be the sports director at WIBK? I said, okay. So... I never went to Nashville and I thought, well, this will last for a year or two. I'll find something else to do. But then it, so that went for a couple of years and then channel 10 called me and I became the sports director at channel 10. And then Jefferson pilot came along. And I mean, it just, it it, it was just a a great decision for me not to go to Nashville and it's worked out very well, but I, I never planned to be a broadcaster. I was just trying to, to find a niche somewhere in sports. And I luckily I, I landed in broadcasting. It's worked out pretty good for me. I want to ask you, uh, obviously I'm going to ask about John Ward next, but Mitch and Jefferson pilot, a, uh, a very special bond that Southeastern conference fans have with JP sports. Talk about your time with JP and what those broadcasts were like. And obviously meant so much to a lot of us. Well, you know, it was funny. Of course, a lot of people now you talk to, I go to talk to broadcasting classes here at UT and you mentioned Jefferson Pilot. I have no idea what you're talking about. And so it was, you know, 25 years ago or something like that. But, you know, Jefferson Pilot was, um, those games were over the air and drew huge numbers. People don't realize that those noon games, numbers wise, because they were over the air, they weren't on cable TV, that uh, they actually outdrew all the ESPN games and some of the biggest, uh, numbers for for SEC football back in those days were those Jefferson Pilot games. And, you know, sometimes we didn't get the best games. We had a lot of Vanderbilt and a lot of South South Carolina and all that kind of stuff. But still, because they were over the air and at noon, a lot of people watched them. But uh, I was, again, fortunate to get involved with Jefferson Pilot. Um, it was in 1989. The SEC tournament was at uh, Thompson Bowling Arena. And uh, I got a call. Uh, one day from Jimmy Rayburn, who was the executive producer. And he said, one of our announcers can't make it to the tournament. They got another job, got a you know, better gig. And uh, he said, uh, we're working for somebody to do uh, in-between game interviews and post-game interviews and basically be a sideline reporter for all the games. He said, now you've got to do them all. You can't pick and choose. You got to be here for every single game. Uh, the only reason I'm calling you is because you're the sports director at Channel 10 and Channel 10 is carrying all the games. I don't have to pay your per diem, put you up at a hotel or pay for a plane fare for you to fly in. 
That's the only reason I'm calling you. If the games were on channel six, I'd be calling their guy. Do you want to work? I said, yeah, let's go. And so that's how I got in with Jefferson Pilot. And so I obviously did a good enough job that first year. They asked me back the next year to, to work the tournament. And then the following year, uh, they added a pregame show. And so I got to a 30 minute pregame show. So I did that and then also started doing some basketball play by play. And then I transferred over to football when we got football in 92. So uh, again, I just got, I was kind of fortunate in the right place at the right time. Uh, Lindsey Nelson, when he retired from the, um, his baseball career, his last, uh, after he left the Mets, he did the Giants for a couple of years, but he came back here and retired up on Cherokee Bluff and overlooks the campus. And uh, he also did stuff with Ch at Channel 10, did what was called Lindsay at Large, which was like an old Andy Rooney type thing on 60 Minutes, a little three minute blurb about nothing about sports. It was about why is Gay Street named Gay Street? Why is the where's General Neyland Berry and all stuff that were just interesting things about Knoxville, but not about sports. And so, and he would do them, it'd be three minutes in length that he wouldn't have a script and you could put a stopwatch on him. And it was one take, it was incredible uh, just watching him work. But he always told me, uh, he said, now you're gonna get one break in this business. Are you ready for the break? Have you worked hard enough? Have you prepared yourself? And when you get the break, can you take advantage of it? And so I really think that uh, one break I got was being able to stay at WIVK as a sports director. But the other big break I got was doing those Jefferson pilot games. And so when I got the call to, to work the network, I was prepared and it worked hard enough that uh, I was able to, to make that transition. And uh, that worked out really well for about 10 years. I want to mention John Ward here. And obviously the name John Ward just echoes across the Southeast. Talk about what he taught you and what you still learn, what you still use today from the late, great John Ward. He always just told you to be prepared. And he said when he got tired of doing the prep work, he would quit doing the broadcast, is which, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, you know, he'd been doing it for 31 years, basketball for 34. Uh, but I got to sit next to him for 15 years as his spotter and just got to, to watch him work. And he would have just – this, you know, whole stack of notes and typed out pages, he'd use maybe a quarter of it, but he was prepared for, if anything came up in the broadcast, he would, um, he'd be prepared for it. He also, we never, of course, not, not many games back when, when I started working there in the seventies and the eighties, um, not many games were on television, maybe one, maybe two a year. And the rest of them, it's all radio, all listening to John Ward. And, um, so that created quite a bond for uh, Tennessee fans and the university and, and the, the football team and, and, and John. They, it was really a close relationship. But he would never let us, when the, if there was a game on TV, he would never let us have a, a monitor in the booth. He said, we're radio guys. We got to get it right the first time. You need to concentrate. I don't want you watching TV. I want you watching the field. And so he was big on concentration and doing it the right way. He would let you make a mistake, but don't make it twice. Don't do the same thing twice or he would jettison you off the network. And he did a bunch of guys that uh, just weren't prepared. He, he hated if you were not prepared and not ready to go. He said he'd always tell us, I don't want you excited for the game. I want you prepared. And, and I've always, that's kind of the way I've approached things too. That, uh, you know, it's exciting. This game Saturday is going to be exciting, but it won't be a lot of fun if, if I'm not prepared to do the game. And so I'm in here studying right now, trying to get ready for the game and going over notes and things like that. Um, so, you know, and I think broadcasting a game is the next best thing to play because you've got the preparation. You got to do something every single day, kind of like the football team. You got to do something every single day to be ready for the broadcast. And uh, so I've got, I've got a routine out. You know, I know what I do on Monday and what I do on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday, and then get ready for, you know, to talk to the coaches and polish things up and be ready to go Saturday. So uh, he told me, he taught me a lot about the preparation work and about being ready when the game comes around on Saturday. Last question I have for you. I want to ask you about your legacy. And, and obviously that's a question that a lot of people don't get to ask legends like yourself, but when it's all said and done, maybe 10 years, five years, 20 years, what would you like your legacy to be for young guys like myself trying to get into this business? I would, I would like to, to, for people to think that I was 
honest on the broadcast that I tried to to paint an accurate picture of what was going on in the game. Um, you know, I don't, John had that flair for the dramatic and, and I don't have that. And if you don't have it, it, it's phony and fake. If you try and, and muster it up, uh, my, I was taught by Lindsay Nelson that you were a reporter first and a broadcaster second. And so I kind of try and approach it that way. I'm, I'm more of a reporter, I guess, than an entertainer or, or whatever. And, and, uh, you know, in broadcasters, I don't care how good you are. They're going to be detractors and people that don't like you and all you get. And that goes with the business. I don't care how good you are. Uh, there are guys that aren't going to like your style or what you say, or they like this guy better or that. And that's all fine and good. But so you got to deflect all of that and just keep focused on trying to do the best broadcast you can. And I just hope people think that I try to give it a good effort every Saturday and, and trying to deliver the, the facts and, the, and the, the final score. John always told us the biggest thing you got to do is get the commercials in and get the score right. And if you do those two things, you'll have a successful broadcast. Anything else above that is kind of gravy. And so I've kind of looked at it like that as well, too. But, uh, I, you know, it's it's been special for us the fact that over the past more than 50 years now, and then you go back to Lindsey Nelson before that, um, you know, for 60 some years, the people that have called Tennessee games are all Tennessee alums um, from the color people, the analysts and everything else and the play by play guys. We've all been Tennessee graduates, which I, I think is I don't know of any other network in America that can say that. And so these games mean something to us. You know, when Pat Ryan and I sit down or Tim Priest, especially when Tim was doing the games with me. I mean, they would, if you'd lose to Alabama, that took part of your soul those days. And uh, so the, the games mean something to, the, to those of us that are Tennessee grads. And uh, that's why this game Saturday is so special because we'd sure as heck like to get back to an SEC championship game. The one thing that has kind of surprised me about all this, we took over in 98, Tim and I did after the national championship. Well, heck, we thought we'd just be, you know, we're, we're rolling. We're going to win SEC championships and more national championships. And I think the thing that's really surprised me the most in the 24 years I, that uh, I've done the games and Tim and I and now Pat are doing them, that we haven't won an SEC championship. That's kind of startling to me. And so I'm, I'm hoping that we can reverse that trend very, very soon here, hopefully this year. He is Bob Kessling, the voice of the Tennessee Volunteers. Bob, thank you so much for coming on the Mitch Davis Show. It's been an honor. Mitch, thanks. Good to talk to you. Thank you very much for having me on. And enjoy.